Okay, hey, every, hey, hello everyone. Um, this is part two of Bronte and Bewick. Um, this I'm filming this right before our very first class, so I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't. Um, so I'll carry on. And um, again, this is that title page for Bewick's History of British Birds and Funny to Note. There's no birds at all on the title page. Um, and I, we will have explored a little bit of chapter one, I think, by this, the time you watch this video. And so um, I wanted to try and draw your attention to, uh, you know, this uh, an interesting quote where, where Jane narrates, each picture told a story mysterious, often to my under undeveloped understanding and imperfect feelings. Okay, in this quote, we run into a very typical romantic idea, which is that we as human beings have a very complex, almost infinite way of experiencing the world um, it's full of depth and mystery, and oftentimes it could go beyond our understanding and our ability to explain it with words. Uh, this is a really important concept that the Romantics wanted to uh, bring up in their in their work. So, what does that tell us about Jane? Well, she is somebody who very much enjoys the excitement of, of the mysterious, um, the, the exploring the depths of her inner world and imagining the world that's beyond, particularly extreme landscapes depicted um, that we're, we're gonna see depicted in Bewick's History of British Birds. Um, he often sets things way in the North in Scandinavia, and, and there's a certain allure and attraction that, that Jane had to this really stark, mysterious uh, type of art that Thomas Bewick was putting together. Here is a picture that she definitely describes in the beginning. Again, nothing to do with birds, um, but um, sort of like a vin it's a vignette, and what a vignette is is um, a way of describing a, actually it comes from the word vine and there, and why vine? Because the bordering on certain pictures were, was often um, accompanied with sort of a floral vine-like bordering. I know you've probably seen it on a, maybe a detailed picture frame. Um, but contained within that vine frame is an image that tells some kind of story and it's up to the reader or the, the viewer to, to interpret what that might be. Jane kind of dips her, her toes into this one but gets a little bit scared. Um, she talks about how it evokes this feeling. She doesn't know what it is. She couldn't really bear to look at it and she says that in this picture you see a thief carrying this bag, I guess, of stolen goods. But then there's this fiend, there's this pointy tail here, pinning down this um, bag so he, he can't pick it up from, from the rock, I guess, that he's been, been sitting on. It must be nighttime. You know, he's working in the cover of night. And again, we see a gate. Um, I feel like the gates sort of symbolize this threshold of reality um, and what what gates there are perhaps symbolize an opening to another dimension, if you will, um, or a supernatural realm. In this case, maybe the gate is an opening into the sky world with the moon and, and there's almost a pagan overtone. We're talking about demons and stuff, even though uh, there's a lot of Christianity in Jane Eyre, there's a lot of paganism going on. And I think Bewick 
highlight some of that. And um, so what is it that Jane's so scared of? Um, that's something that we could definitely spend some time discussing. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more. I like uh, this one here, some some neat clouds. Again, this was these were woodcuts, so this was like carved in a piece of wood or maybe even metal. I'd have to ask Mr. Crothers, he would know. And then it's dipped in ink and then pressed down and stamped onto paper. So it's done in reverse, very, very interesting process and detailed. See all these wonderful clouds. You can even see the light shining through them, an old castle. And we know it's old because the, the world around it, the natural environment seems to be encroaching upon it. Um, ivy's growing over it. And um, you know, there's no king or duke living there. But we do have this sort of hermit figure living here in this cottage, also overgrown. There's a prominence given to to the uh, you know the trees and the, the growing things through the natural world. And here we have the the hermit living within that, almost maybe in harmony with that, um, interacting with a traveler. Whatever is on his back. Could it be some kind of instrument? I, I don't know. But an interesting little story um, being told here. Uh, lots of speculation as to what it could be. But we do see a lot of romantic elements here going on. And, and this was something, I'll, I'll reiterate, this is something that Charlotte Bronte looked at when she was a child. And um, again, in Jane Eyre. We know that Jane was was very much into these these pictures and images. Some of it, some, this one she doesn't describe, um, you know, specifically. The other two we talked about before, I think she alludes to those ones specifically. Um, so let me also show you some more images from Bewick's History of British Birds. Here, this one. Okay, here's some crows. But here we have a. Um, somebody who's been hung formerly in the gallows again um, this sort of morbid curiosity going on here um, again much to do with the the, the artistic sensibility that the, the sort of taste of the romantic era was one which did not want to ignore the fact that life and death are intertwined okay there's no sort of glossing over the fact and i think that that might have been something the enlightenment tried to explain away perhaps or even in, in the renaissance the idea that um you know death is you know not the end don't concern with yourself with it if you're living a holy life you're going to get to go to heaven and don't worry about the bad people because they'll get to go to hell okay so that's explained if you're a believer and you shouldn't give much more thought to it obviously the romantics are a little bit more curious about death and life and the cycle that is involved in the two um let's see if i can get to the next slide here um okay here we see a a really interesting scene here these are icebergs jutting out of a very cold northerly sea they have harvested it looks like um some some sort of sea mammal i think it could be seals or and the bones i think are left behind there's a, a kayak here and two figures um sort of taking in the view now jane talks about how attractive these icy distant landscapes where there's something at the same time shocking mysterious maybe a little bit frightening but also captivating um, i think they also reminded jane that you know there's 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 a big world out there she's trapped in this one house with um, under the tyranny of aunt reed and her cousin john reed and to some extent her two cousins um, eliza and georgiana and here we go into this book where you escape into these polar um, northern Icelandic or Scandinavian landscapes. Um, 
Here we have Bewick's depiction of a female horned owl. Notice what stands out to me is the eyes. And again, lots of plant imagery and the details in the tree bark or the, the, the bark of the, the bush, the tendrils of the, of the twigs, um, you know, just as important as the bird itself. But the eyes, okay, um, if you rearrange the letters in air, you get the word I, E, R, I, or somebody who is an I, or somebody who sees. We'll talk more about the name Jane Eyre um, coming up, but here again, I think this is a beautiful picture. Again, a very natural scene. We have a heron that's been hunting. It's uh, captured some kind of salamander, I guess, because it's got these weird little uh, fins here. Um, again, it's uh, an image of death. It's not some pretty little bird. It's a bird that's predatory, um, preying on an innocent little serpentine creature. Here we have another old church, a graveyard, stones sort of tipped over, um, a really distant horizon. Um, again, all of this stuff is the, the, this concern with the ruins of time and the way that the natural world over time sort of seems to swallow up human endeavors. Uh, that's definitely going on here. Um, here is another scene with some water bushes. I translated this Latin saying, it's hard to read, but basically it's an ode to, to nature. Let my delight be the country and the running streams amid the dells. May I love the waters and the woods, though fame be lost. Um, so... It's almost like an ode to solitude and, and the reassurance one might be able to find um, in nature should fame be lost, should there be um, alienation in your life. Um, yeah, and a few birds here, okay, in keeping with the title of the book. Um, there it is again, with that Latin inscription, a little more prominent. I don't know what the number 13 might mean. Oh, also you can see swallowed up in in this there are two people fishing okay notice how nature's big man is small humans are small oh, very strange um bewick again kind of morbid this is a guy hanging a cat i guess because cats could be kind of an, a nuisance or you know they, they breed quick they didn't have neutering in Spain back in the day. So maybe it was a common thing, killing cats. Okay, this curiosity about death uh, going on here in this image. Again, a bird killing a rabbit. Um, here we have some poor, maybe he was a fisherman or walking around. He's swept away by these currents. His dog is sort of safe on this branch. Um, and he's about to get swept away. Here we have a nice picture of an owl who has captured another bird and eaten the head off. Here we have a man on thin ice. He's carrying the stick in case he might fall through and, and you know, sort of have something to claw his way out with. Again, a sort of everyday image, people interacting with the natural world, the rustics, if you will, the peasant class. Here's another nice picture of a bird. Okay, so we'll conclude in the next installment, part three.